You've heard about lung protective ventilation. It's a collection of ventilation strategies that we know are good for the lungs when a patient is at risk for lung injury. Lung protective ventilation has usually included restricting tidal volumes, keeping plateau pressures below 30 cm of water, and setting a higher level of PEEP. The thinking surrounding lung protective ventilation has evolved in recent years. Classically, it had been taught that we ought to ventilate the lung, and especially the lung with ARDS, with a tidal volume of between 4 to 8 cc per kg of ideal body weight. The problem with this rule of thumb is that it assumes that all lungs are equal, which obviously they are not. Why are all lungs not equal? That is because not all disease processes are equal or affect individuals equally. To visualize this, Gattinoni uses the concept of targeting ventilation to the baby lung in ARDS. So what is the baby lung? The portion of lung units unaffected by the disease process causing ARDS is the baby lung. They're still recruitable, functional, have a relatively normal compliance and effectively participate in gas exchange. The good lung within the total lung is the baby lung. Hence the rationale of targeting this smaller functional lung with a low tidal volume strategy. Because of the heterogeneity, the spatial, temporal, technical limitations of the measurement of the respiratory system mechanics, the size of the baby lung is difficult to measure by the bedside. So we often use surrogate markers or calculations based upon predicted lung size relative to a patient's sex and height. With regard to lung protection and the baby lung, the choice of tidal volume has proven to be the most important for outcomes till date. Look at this figure. The normal lung here on the right might be able to tolerate a little more than the 4 to 8 cc per kilo without being harmed. While providing the diseased lung here on the left with a very low tidal volume strategy, say even 4 to 6 cc per kilo may still exceed the size of the baby lung and result in further lung injury. The problem here is obvious, right? Predicted body weight tracks well with the healthy lung, however, has no relation to the size of an individual patient's baby lung because every pneumonia, every aspiration, every inflammatory lung disease process and everybody's lung size is different. What about plateau pressure then? Can we use that as a guide to decide how much tidal volume to give a patient? Certainly, but not quite. Let's make sure we understand why. Plateau pressure is the pressure within the lung after inspiration has completed and flow has stopped. We have traditionally adjusted tidal volume and PEEP to achieve plateau pressures below 30 cm of water. But why? As a surrogate marker for alveolar and therefore lung distending pressures, plateau pressure is of interest since it's really not a specific level of volume or pressure responsible for lung injury, but it is the gradient of pressure or force across the alveolar wall, the transmural transpulmonary or lung distending pressure that results in injury and therefore is of most interest to us. The problem with this is that the plateau pressure is influenced not just by our ventilator settings, but patient characteristics such as body habitus, positioning, effects of gravity, and abdominal pressure. So for example, patients who are obese or who have abdominal distension for any pathology may have a lower chest wall compliance and when measured can show falsely high plateau pressures. This makes plateau pressure an unreliable measure of safe lung ventilation. So if tidal volume and plateau pressures may not always be accurate in setting up safe ventilation of the baby lung, what do we use? And that's why we want to explain to you the concept of driving pressures. So what is driving pressure and how do you use it for your patients? We can start by taking a look at the definition of driving pressure. It's defined as the difference between the plateau pressure and the total PEEP. The PEEP, of course, is the end expiratory pressure, which should include both the intrinsic PEEP and the extrinsic PEEP. Intrinsic PEEP is important to consider, especially in patients with small airway disease, while extrinsic PEEP is the ventilator setting you have control over. The plateau pressure, as we saw earlier, is the end inspiratory pressure. This difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP is the change in pressure, or the delta P, 
or your driving pressure. Now the compliance of any system is a change in volume for a unit change in pressure. Compliance of the respiratory system is the quotient of the tidal volume divided by the change in pressure within the respiratory system, that is the plateau pressure minus the PEEP. We know that plateau pressure minus PEEP is nothing but the driving pressure. Hence, compliance is tidal volume divided by driving pressure. Moving things around, there you have it. Driving pressure equals tidal volume divided by the respiratory system compliance. The PV curve we all know and love relates to the mechanical properties of the lung and chest wall. Its slope represents the compliance of these two structures working in concert and it technically is not the lung compliance but the respiratory system compliance. It's sigmoidal in shape, you know why? We can see that it takes a significant change in pressure before we get much change in volume. This is because we need that pressure to work against the surface tension to open up the atelectactic lung. Moving below this lower inflection point increases the tendency of alveolar collapse, the risk of open and close injury, and overall represents the zone of atelect trauma. Moving beyond this upper inflection point, where a large change in pressure for a minimal increase in volume can begin to result in structural components and elastic properties of the lung to being stressed. And so, this zone represents the zone of overdistension, which may result in barotrauma, volutrauma, or even pneumothorax. Of course, the change in pressure over time equals work, and therefore, reducing driving pressure will also reduce the work of breathing. Optimal lung compliance is represented right here on this part of the curve between the upper and lower inflection points. As just discussed, avoiding the extremes of the curve beyond the lower inflection and upper inflection points will also minimize the likelihood of lung injury. So as you can see, there are multiple benefits of targeting our ventilation strategies to this deep portion of the PV curve between these two points. Now that we know that, you definitely want to be on the steep portion of this curve, which is why you have to have lower driving pressures. How do we know this though? How do we know that keeping driving pressures low is actually what keeps the lung safe? What's the evidence behind this? The association between driving pressure and patient outcomes was first suggested in 2002, but the bridge between driving pressure and mortality was not demonstrated until a 2015 New England Journal of Medicine article by Amato et al. The findings of this study are clearly outlined in these figures. In the first set, you see a steady peep, but a rising plateau pressure, with a resultant rising driving pressure. The outcome is increasing mortality. The second set also has a rising plateau pressure, but the PEEP rises concomitantly while the driving pressure staying steady. The result, mortality stays flat. In the third set, PEEP keeps rising while plateau pressures stay the same, resulting in declining driving pressures. The outcome, declining mortality. This shows that rather than low plateau pressures or higher PEEP, survival is much closely correlated with reducing driving pressure. Looking at this another way, this is another figure from the same paper. As you can see here, reducing tidal volume as determined by ideal body weight did not really affect mortality, while decreasing tidal volume scaled to the compliance of the respiratory system directly correlated with reductions in mortality. The question then arises, what's a safe driving pressure? The answer is, we don't know for sure, but we do have an educated guesstimate. As you can see, mortality and driving pressure have a linear relationship. So there is no truly safe driving pressure. However, the risk of mortality greatly increases when the driving pressure gets above 16 centimeter of water. A more recent study by Villar et al. suggests that the driving pressure of up to 18 cm of water may be safe. Armed with this information, let's move from the chalkboard to the bedside. How does this knowledge affect your ventilator management? You can get an estimate of the driving pressure by calculating the plateau pressure minus the PEEP. The PEEP is a setting we have direct control over using the ventilator. The plateau pressure, on the other hand, is not so straightforward. 
In intubated patients, in order to measure the plateau pressure, we perform an inspiratory pause or breath hold. This temporarily holds the entire tidal volume inside the lung at the end of inspiration, not allowing any flow of air in or out of the lung. This gives us the static pressure inside the lung at that point in time when there is no flow and therefore no flow resistance or airway resistance contributing to the pressure measurement. In other words, the plateau pressure. Thus, plateau pressure cannot be obtained if the patient is actively breathing during the measurement. Calculate the difference between the plateau pressure and the PEEP and voila, you have the driving pressure. Keep it below 16 to 18 centimeter of water and you are truly providing the lung with protective ventilation. So you're tinkering around with your patient's ventilator. The driving pressure you've calculated is 24. You need to reduce it. How do you do that? Let's try. And while we are at it, let's also try to correlate it with our old friend, the PV curve. You can start by increasing the PEEP. Since driving pressure is the plateau pressure minus the PEEP, increasing the PEEP will reduce the driving pressure. As long as this is working for you, you know that you are in the zone of underinflation. An additional PEEP will be helpful. But you can only keep doing this as long as the plateau pressure also does not rise simultaneously as you increase the PEEP. Once that begins to happen, you know that you've recruited the optimal number of alveoli, which puts you at the lower inflection point on the PV curve. Any further increase in PEEP will result in a similar increase in the plateau pressure, leaving the driving pressure unchanged. At this point, you will be on the safe zone of the PV curve. Now, if you keep pushing and further increase the PEEP, you'll reach a point where the plateau pressure rises a lot more than the raised PEEP, dangerously raising the driving pressure. This tells you that you're in the zone of overdistension and that you ought to dial down the PEEP. The trick is in finding the PEEP sweet spot to put us in the safe zone of the PV curve. Let us look at a ventilator waveform. Let's calculate your driving pressures here. Driving pressures is plateau minus PEEP, which is 18 minus 5 becomes 13. As we mentioned, any changes in the total PEEP can result in changes in the driving pressures. So let's increase the PEEP from 5 to 10 and see for ourselves. What's the driving pressure now? Plateau minus PEEP here is 19 minus 10, which is 9. We see that the driving pressure was lowered without increasing the plateau pressure or the distending pressure. One way to think about it is, a decrease in driving pressure after an increase in PEEP would reflect recruitment. On the other hand, if increasing PEEP results in a larger increase in driving pressure, this would suggest a non-recruitable lung and that we may be violating the upper inflection point on your PV curve. And here a decrease in tidal volume may be necessary. And now let's see what happens in the same patient if we decrease the tidal volume. Decreasing the tidal volume immediately lowered the plateau pressure and in turn lowered your driving pressures as well. So how do you accomplish reducing driving pressure by just turning the ventilator knobs? After what we just noted, you do them by increasing the PEEP, reducing the tidal volume, or by doing a combination of the two. Oftentimes, making independent adjustments of either of them, followed by close observation and repeating the changes to one of these parameters, may be necessary to optimize ventilation for your patient. The things that I would remember as a take-home from this lecture is the concept that we learned is airway driving pressure. This can reduce ventilator-induced lung injury and has shown to be a predictor of mortality. It's easy to calculate, requires no additional equipment, However, there are pitfalls to it. This begins to address the shortcomings and integrates all of the separate variables in the ventilator settings together. This also helps in providing constant feedback at the bedside for you to adjust ventilator settings. This way, driving pressure helps in personalization in the age of individualized medicine. <laughs>